Okay, so going back, you grew up in South Florida? No, nah, no. Nah, so I was born in Jersey, and okay. I grew up as like a, a child in New Jersey. Then okay. I lived in New York City, and then I went to South Florida, which is where I was for the last eight years. Before. New York City from what age to what age? Um, so I lived in Jersey near New York City. So I spent a lot of like my childhood in New York City and around okay. New York City. I got my first official like Manhattan address. Uh-huh. I must have been, let's see, so I was I was incarcerated for a lot of like early adulthood. So I'd say roughly like... 20 years old i think i got 19 or 20 i think i got my first address and then i finally got a florida address like um 20 uh 24 ish so, okay. something in that range but so you were incarcerated repeatedly before that what was going on at that time i spent um between ages 15 and 21 almost fully incarcerated uh-huh. um i was just like a real like wild push the envelope in any opportunity i could type of guy i saw like really no bounds um and i didn't have any consciousness of consequence mm. so like how did that play out like you're a young man like what, what were you like in high school maybe we should start there um so i was always like uh like Maybe like one of the more pop. I was just in the popular crowd, and okay. I was kind of like one of the leaders of that crowd. Even I dated like the best looking girl from any of the schools in my district. Um, they all like won senior superlative, like you know, best looking and stuff like that. But I didn't do school much. I was um, so I'm always a straight A student my whole life, except that I really just didn't care. So when it came to my behavior, I was expelled. I mean, I might possibly hold a record for most times expelled in my district, and then welcome back to another one of the district schools. Really. Went to a bunch of behavioral schools. We call the teacher by their first name, stuff like that. I even got expelled from a few of those. I got expelled from one of the most hardcore behavioral schools in the region without ever even attending it. How? So some of my buddies that did go to that school, I used to like break in sometimes and like smoke weed with them during class. And then finally I just got caught, you know, just causing a scene. And they're like, you're done here. And, and so what were the primary things you were getting expelled for, though? Um fighting uh i used to like throw chairs at you know if, uh, i used to fight my teachers a lot uh because I was, I was disruptive so they would tell me to you know sh- shush up and i just i didn't like anybody talking to me in any type of way right so i'd really you know accelerate the situation throw chairs at them um i had sex a lot in school i actually started a trend in uh in my high school one of the high schools i went to uh, so I was in juvenile prison and I got out the day before junior year was going to start and I it was out here out west uh, and so I flew to New Jersey to attend this first day of my junior year and I got a hand job during art class <laughs> and for the first two days they were trying to like Somebody had, like, snitched trying to figure out what had happened. They found the cum on the ground or something? No. no. I was sit- so the girl jerking me off, there was another girl sitting next to me that was none too pleased with my uh, dick being out in class. That makes sense. Yeah, so it took two days to expel me, and then after that, like, it was like a trend in that school. Why do you think you were acting out so much? Like, was your, your family life good? Your parents normal or no? I have uh, great parents. I was born into what was at the time an affluent family. Uh-huh. Um, I have a great family. My parents are still together. My dad did uh, have a racketeering and RICO case and some organized crime. And, um, you know, he did go to federal prison. And at the time, I'd said, no, I've always just been wild. And uh-huh. looking back, I assume, you know, that there could be some role that played in me acting out. Right. Yeah. My dad went to prison for like a year when I was in like fifth, sixth grade. And it, like looking back on it, I just see how it caused me to act out. It made me so angry, and I was kind of oblivious to that as a young man. That that was like the reason why I was fighting every day and like couldn't behave in school and shit. As I was just like deeply upset about it and upset about what it was doing to my family and all the pressure it was putting on my mom. But I didn't really, you know, I was too young to like get that. That's how my brain worked. I th- I think that that's similar to what happened. With yeah, me, yeah, definitely. So you, you graduated high school? No, 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 no. I actually, while incarcerated, I taught myself. Uh, I studied and took my GED, taught myself, studied, and took my SATs and applied to five colleges. Got accepted to all five, all while incarcerated. Wow. But I couldn't get reparoled in time to attend. Okay. But you know, I, I got my GED while while incarcerated. But what was the thing that actually got you incarcerated? Uh, I'd been incarcerated quite a few times, but it was always like um, drugs and violence, and it was basically my whole my whole jacket is just drugs and violence. Right. So while you're locked up, would you describe it as like a rehabilitative uh, experience, or, or were you still sort of entrenched in all this bad behavior? When I was young, going in and out of these jails, um, I, it was like almost like criminology 101. Right. You know, I was like gaining, you know, more connections and more understanding of how to be an adult 
criminal or what have you. Get caught, what's the smart hustles to get involved with. Yeah. Right. And then as I got a little bit older and I was still getting in trouble, I'm like, what a loser I am. Like, how can I just still be in the same place I was as a kid? And everything that people said about me when I was young is true. And right. I said, I don't want to be like that. So how are your parents reacting while you're locked up? Like, if you come from a fluent family, they're probably really disappointed. So, yeah, they're really disappointed. In the beginning, I was going to jail so much, it's a true story, that my mother actually became a bail bondsman to make everyone's life easier. Wow. Yeah, and then um, at some point they said, you know what, he's better off in there because at least we know he's alive and we know he's not committing more crimes or anything like that. Right. So they kind of just let me sit happily, you know? They put a little bit of money on my books and just... Let me dry out. And were you miserable being in there, or was it overall a good experience? And when I was young, it was as miserable as you can get. You know, I'm young. I'm, I have all this energy and all my. I'm like still in high school age. You know what I mean? Like all mm. my friends are seniors, and they're like partying and this and that. And here I am sitting in jails and prisons. And um, but then when I got older, I sort of just I came to terms. Like you know, I made I made a decision. Every decision I have has a consequence, good or bad. I earned my spot in this cell, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do my time. I'm gonna come out a better man. Right. How bad were you before the drugs before or with the drugs before you went in? I, uh, with drugs specifically? Yeah, or like in drinking and everything. Were you like really self-destructive or was this still kind of casual? Um, I was self-destructive for sure. It definitely didn't help anything. That was like for sure. Never, never helped. Um, but even if I took like drug use or, or drinking off the table, like uh, let's say like that wasn't even a part of my story, just my behavior in that drug-fueled lifestyle mm. was the most destructive thing. You know, just... It's like no bar for the law, this no regard for any consequence and just pushing the limit all the time, being violent, um, guns, things like this, always. Right. Yeah. It's all bad. Yeah. So you get out of prison and then you move to Florida? Is that how that worked? So um, that did happen, yeah. Then I moved back from Florida and I moved back to New York. Uh, I had stolen a car. My, my thing for a while was home invasions okay. and then on the way out stealing cars. So I had done this for the last time in Florida. Uh, it's been more than seven years, for the okay. record. Yeah. Uh, and but you were making a lot of money doing this? Like, would you go in people's houses? What did you get? I mean, everything. Really? Anything and everything. And, um, yeah, it was just, like, more than money. It was, like, just, like, access to more pockets in, in that lifestyle, you know? Like, let's say I came across somebody and was like, hey, does anybody know a guy with this? I was always the guy with or could be with anything at any time. Uh -huh. So more people wanted to contact me saying, hey, can you get this for me? And just offered me more opportunities in that lifestyle. Right. And you take the car on the way out. So, yes, yeah, so I take the car on the way out. Um, honestly, stealing cars is not really that profitable to be like super. It's like, I don't know if whoever knows about it. It's right. like really you not steal a good $100,000 car. What do you do with it? You bring mm -hmm. it to somebody who's going to give you 10 grand? Yeah. So there's like a few options. You can get someone to do like VIN swaps. Uh, you can sell it for scrap. Um, you can sell it and people will ship it in a crate to islands and stuff like that. But there's like no version where you're stealing a $100,000 car. And, and getting 80% of that even? Not. the the My lawyer fees 100% of the time outweigh mm. the money I was making. I'm uh, sure yeah. almost all criminals could probably say that if they were to be totally honest. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So the last the last thing I did in Florida that that time was uh, home invasion, stole a car, and I had to get rid of this car, and I just needed out. The situation was so hot. I did it while the people were home. Uh, it was not technically. I don't know actually if it was home invasion, not a home invasion, but I did not like harm anybody. You know, I was just kind of in and out. Took the car. I want to get rid of the car, and um, so I hopped on a bus and I said, let me just you know get out of here. And um, I didn't have anywhere to go. So I went to New York and I was kind of just homeless. Hmm. And uh, basically that's where the good stuff in my, in my life started was while I was homeless in New York. So you're homeless. Yeah. Do you have all the face tattoos and shit at this point yet? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when did that occur? Like when did you make that decision? I, I, f I, got, my f I got two face tattoos for the first time I ever face tattooed my face. I must have been like, I, I was living in Manhattan. Maybe I was younger th when I moved there. Maybe I was like 19 or something. And I was walking through Harlem, and uh, you know the uh, show Black Ink? Uh, yeah, the tattoo show? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I was a little bit of a figure in the tattoo world, like really, really small. I, I was on some shows and magazines, stuff like that. So these guys knew me, and they called me. I said, we're filming today. Do you want to get your face tattooed on, on TV? Wow. And I was like, I want to get my face tattooed anyway. So, so then I got both my sideburns done. And okay. then just like pretty quickly, it just kept going. Right. Did it become an addiction? You sound like you have a really addictive personality. I, I would say, yeah. I'd say, yeah. It be, the tattoo shit became an addiction. Is that how you ended up with a black arm? What was on there before that? 
It was a lot of like uh, kill cop and uh, <laughs> like gang stuff. <laughs> gang stuff. Yeah. You were affiliated with an actual gang. Yeah, yeah, f for like uh, like the whole middle section of my life. Was it was it like a white gang, or were you like the one white boy in it? Um, it was um, it was a not a white gang, but it was a gang that did have like I'd say a lot of white members for a non-white gang. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't feel that out of it? Did you like? I feel like nowadays, like when I talk to gang members, it's either because that's where they're from, or because they have problems with certain people, so they just sort of end up like getting adopted into it. Were you part of a gang more from like a criminal angle? Like you were actually doing all this crazy shit criminally? I yeah, I was. I mean, if you want to like the real true heartedness of it, like sure. I was just so wild and just always trying to push the limits that I just wanted to feel surrounded by other guys with equal energy as me. And all these other dudes were like, we're gangsters, we're criminals, you know, we're going to hurt people and we're going to make money to do it. Uh, are you in or you out? And I said, yeah, sign me up. Right. You didn't seem like the kind of guy at that point in your life who was going to say no to that kind of thing. Exactly. <laughs> For sure. So, okay, you're, you're homeless with a face full of fucking tattoos and you're on the run from the situation in Florida. How does how does this turn into a positive thing? So I'm homeless. Uh, you know, I've been homeless on and off in my life. You know, in, in between incarcerations, and uh, this time I'm homeless. I'm in um, I'm in the Heights, Washington Heights, and I was actually uh, living in Highbridge Park. Now, what happened was there was this uh, black dude. His name was Shorty, and he had robbed me like a few weeks prior, and I hadn't seen him since. And I finally caught him out there another time, and I, I was like, "Hey man, you know, how are we gonna fix this?" And he goes, "I know you need a place to live." I got a sick setup, you know, on top of the park. Now, over there, what happens is all the homeless, they live underneath the backside of the park, right? Okay. What he did, which I thought was ingenious, and this is in the wintertime, is he actually built uh, using um, uh, shipping crates, like, you know, those wooden pallets? Uh -huh. He used those wooden pallets to build, uh, like, a fort on top of the park, camouflage because we had, it was snowing, so camouflage with a tarp. Uh, and the snow on top, in between trees, right on top, which is the safest park. That's like where families are walking their kids and stuff like that. So it was camouflaged in there, and the entrance was in the backside by the wall. And he goes, I'll let you live with me as long as you need, and we'll call it even. And I said, okay. And how big was this actual area? It was... Like, uh, as big as this carpet between us and the camera right now? Roughly. So whatever, like... I don't know how big exactly the shipping crates are, the, uh, the wooden yeah. pallets, but it was uh, four pallets made out you know, the, the floor. It was four pallets and then just one pallet in height for each side. And then uh, on top, he didn't have pallets. He had something else, I think like plywood or something, and then the tarp. It's always pretty crazy when I'm driving down the highway and I see some of the structures the homeless people build. And I'm like, wow, like that's really fucking impressive. And I mean, I can only imagine if you were able to take that energy and put it into something that would maybe be a little more permanent. But yeah. So what is your life like when you're living in the park there? Like, what are you doing day by day? Um... Just hustling, strong arm robberies. Um, there was like a lot of there was like a lot of stick up boys around that area. Uh -huh. So it wasn't like impossible to make enough money to survive one day, if you even want to call that level of living surviving. Right. Damn. So you getting fucked up at that point as well, or are you over it by yeah. then? Yeah, I mean, I was, I, I had been, I had been done over it, you know, but, um, but yeah, I was still using. I mean, there was like nothing else. I had like no, no aspirations, nothing happening in my life. What was your go-to drug, like the one that you were ideally doing? I'm sure you were doing ones that you weren't in favor of most of the time. I mean, I like, time. I like, you know, opiates and, and always some blow, and you know. Okay. Mm. So you're really like, but man, it must be hard to afford that lifestyle when you're also living on the streets. Yeah, except there was no bills. So, I mean, <laughs> any dollar coming in can also go out. 